You are listening to RudolfSteinerAudio.com. If you are listening to the podcast of this, it is located at RudolfSteiner.Podbean.com. Please consider becoming a patron. As well, there are two publishing houses, SteinerBooks.org in America and RudolfSteinerPress.com in England, who are the sole publishers of Steiner into English and have given me permission to do these recordings. Please consider patronizing them as well. This is a reading of a cycle of lectures by Rudolf Steiner entitled Wonders of the World, Trials of the Soul, and Revelations of the Spirit. This is Lecture 6. We have now given special attention in these lectures to something that was presented in the dramas you have just seen acted, and which also stands in the closest inner connection with the aim of these lectures. This was the way in which the world of the Greek divinities was organized. We may ask why, if we want to arrive at certain elucidations about the wonders of the world, the trials of the soul, and the revelations of the spirit, we should have dealt so largely with this world of Greek divinities. We can reply that it is just through this and many another such study that we can create a necessary substratum for the conceptions of spiritual science. We have mentioned that the ancient Greek did not in the least possess that conception of nature which is ours today. When we call up a picture of ancient Greece with its life of thought and feeling as it really was, we never meet there with chemical, physical and biological laws in our modern sense. What flamed up within the spirit of this wonderful Greek civilization, what shone forth in the soul of the old Greek when his eye, e.y.e., either physical or clairvoyant, was directed toward the wonders of the world, took the form of a kind of knowledge or wisdom. And when we seek to picture this to ourselves, we cannot do it otherwise than by the wonderful structure of the world of Greek divinities. Anyone considering this world of the Greek gods, as is usually done, without an inner connection, knows in truth nothing of what it really represents. In the wisdom of its construction, this world of the Greek gods is nothing less than an answer, such as the Greek could give, to the question, what shines forth in the human soul when this soul beholds the wonders of the universe? Not by natural law in our present sense did the soul of the ancient Greek respond to the riddles and wonders of the world by endowing with form the various members of divine beings or forces. Hence, in those wonderful clues which we have followed, and which have been unraveled in so striking a manner in the previous lectures, we cannot help seeing, when these clues are gathered together, that this world of the Greek divinities presents to us but the equivalent of our own wisdom, dry, prosaic, and abstract as it is. If we want to make true progress in spiritual science, We must acquire a feeling that we must learn to think and feel in quite another way about the wonders of the universe than is done by the newer and more modern wisdom. In the last lecture, however, through the fact that our attention was directed to the form of Dionysus, we have already pointed to something else. If we picture the rest of the world of Greek divinities as that which arose in the soul of the Greek when he sought to understand the wonders of the world, then, in the form of Dionysus, we meet with something in which the ancient Greek concealed what might, in the widest sense, be called life's contradiction. And we arrive nowhere unless we take this contradiction into consideration. Abstract logic, abstract intellectual thinking, is ever bent on the discovery of contradictions, especially in the higher conceptions of the universe, in order that it may say, quote, this conception of the universe is full of contradictions, so it cannot hold good, close quote. But as a matter of fact, life, the living structure of our world wonders, is everywhere permeated by contradiction. There could not possibly be a development in the world if contradiction or opposition were not found in all things, at the very basis of their existence. For why is the world different today from what it was yesterday? Why does anything become? Why does not everything remain the same? 
because in the condition of things yesterday there was a contradiction, an opposition within themselves. And through the realization of this opposition and through the expulsion of it, the condition of today has come about. The man who really meditates on things as they are dare not say that through realizing contradictions we discover untruths, for contradictions exist in everything actual. How would it be with the human soul if it were free from contradiction? When we look back over our life from any point of time, we see that it has passed, that it has been passed in contradictions. If at a later point of time we are more perfect than at an earlier, this comes about because we have done away with an earlier condition, having found it in opposition to our own inner being. We have thus evoked a reality of our inner being in contradiction to what had previously existed. Contradiction is to be found at the basis of all existence. But we find it more especially when from the point of view of spiritual science we consider the complete fourfold man as we are accustomed to view him in the light of occult facts. And here this contradiction speaks not only to our understanding, to our philosophy, but to our hearts. This fundamental basis of spiritual science must ever dwell in our souls, namely, that we must consider man as he appears before us, as being composed of physical body, etheric body, astral body, and ego. Our human entity consists of these four members. Now let us look at these four members of man as we meet with them in the physical world. Thus, for a moment, we want to turn away from the fact of how a human entity appears to clairvoyant sight, and we want to ask how the four members of man's being appear to the physical eye, how they appear in the physical world. Let us take the inmost member of man's being, the one which, as you know, we consider as the youngest, the ego, or more correctly the vehicle of the ego. The most striking peculiarity of this human ego immediately appears before us when we consider the world with even a little understanding. What is the most striking quality of this human ego? It is that we can travel the length and breadth of the world with our external sense apparatus, with all the cognitional forces which we possess for the physical world, and nowhere shall we find this ego. It is not visible to our eyes, neither is it observable by any powers of external cognition whatsoever. Hence, when standing in the presence of another person in the physical world, we want to consider him only physically, when we have no assistance from clairvoyant sight, we can never observe this other human being's ego with instruments that are merely physical. The man stands before us, we see his external form, but his ego is withdrawn from our powers of physical cognition. We go about among people, but we do not see their egos with our organs of external observation. Were anyone to think that he could see egos, it would be the grossest self-deception. Thus we cannot observe the ego itself with our external physical powers of cognition. We can only observe its manifestations. A man may be a thoroughly mendacious subject as regards his inner being. If he gives no outward expression to his lies, so that these pass into the external world, we cannot perceive this characteristic of his ego with our physical organs, which are of no use whatsoever for the observation of the ego. However far we may investigate with our external physical cognitional forces, there is one single case only in which we meet with the ego. Although we are well aware that there are so many egos in the world, still there is but one, and one only we can meet with for observation vis-à-vis -vis our own. In the physical world and for physical instruments of cognition, there is for each person only one possibility of observing an ego, and that is his own. So we may say that the ego, the youngest and also the highest member of the human entity, has this peculiarity that it can be examined in respect of its nature and its reality in one example only. As regards all of the human beings, 
so far as we are concerned, the ego is shut away from us within its own living sheath. Let us now pass from the ego as the innermost and as the highest, although the youngest member of the human entity, and take the outermost, the physical body. As you already know through explanations given both in lectures and in writings during recent years, the physical body in its true innermost being is cognizable for clairvoyant sight alone. To external consciousness, to the physical cognitional forces of man, the physical body is revealed only as maya, as illusion. That which we have before us in man, as his physical body, is outwardly illusion. But this illusion of the physical body is seen in as many examples as there are human beings on the earth. And in this respect our own physical body, in so far as it is maya, is seen as similar in kind to the bodies of other men. Now there is a great difference between the perception of our own ego presented to us in the one example and the perception of physical human bodies which are presented to us in as many examples as there are persons on the earth. We come to know the ego only when we direct physical cognition upon ourselves. If we want to know our ego, we must look into ourselves with the cognitional force acquired on the physical plane. Seeing that there is so great a lack of clearness on this matter even among thinkers, it may here be remarked parenthetically that what is meant is that what we can perceive of our ego with the forces of physical cognition belongs absolutely to the physical world. It would be nonsense to say that what a man finds with his normal faculties in his inner being as his ego belongs to any other world than to the physical. If anyone should want to attribute to another world than that of the physical plane, the ego which is not observed clairvoyantly but with the normal powers, then he would have committed himself to an enormous mistake. Things seem quite different in higher worlds to the higher consciousness, and the ego appears quite other to clairvoyant consciousness than does that which one finds within oneself to normal consciousness. Concerning this ego of which external psychology and other external science speaks, we cannot believe otherwise than that it is something that belongs to the physical plane. We look at it, however, from within. And because we stand, as it were, within this ego, so that we view it from within and do not confront it externally, we can say, we certainly know, learn to know this ego only on the physical plane, but at least we do get to know it in its inner nature through direct cognitional forces. The external physical body, however, that which we see in so many examples in the world, we learn to know only as maya, for in the moment the physical body is confronted by clairvoyant powers, it disperses like a cloud, it vanishes, and reveals itself to be Maya. If we want to, be <coughs> excuse me, if we want to become acquainted with the physical body in its true form, we must rise not merely to the astral plane, but into the highest regions of spirit land, the devakonic plane. For a highly developed form of clairvoyance is necessary if we desire to know the physical body in its true form. Here, below, in this physical world, we have but an illusionary imitation of the physical body. And this imitation is what we see when we confront it from outside. Thus we are presented with a highly remarkable contradiction. When we have these two members of the human organism, the lowest and the highest, under consideration. Here below in the physical world, we see the human physical organism as maya. That is, we see it in a way that is not in the very least proportioned to our inmost being. But the ego, on the other hand, we see here below as very well adapted in its physical nature to our inner being. I ask you to take careful notice of this, for it is an extraordinarily important fact. I should like to explain this highly remarkable fact to you half symbolically, and yet with the deepest seriousness of reality, from another side, because this half symbolical method 
owing to its richness, is more adapted to express the truth of this matter than could be done by abstract ideas. Speaking now half symbolically, half in deep earnestness, we must bear in mind that Adam and Eve, before the fall, were in paradise. We know how the story says that before the fall, Adam and Eve could not see one another's physical body, and that when they did see their physical bodies, they were ashamed of them. Herein a deep mystery is expressed. In the Old Testament, it is hinted why, after the fall, Adam and Eve were ashamed of their physical bodies. It is indicated that the earlier body, which they had had before the fall, was more or less a spiritual body. That is to say, it was accessible only to clairvoyant consciousness, a body the outward appearance of which was quite different from a physical human body, one that would have expressed the nature of the ego in its true form. Thus we have to allow that the Bible shows that a completely different formation of body, and one certainly only perceptible to clairvoyant sight, would be suitable for the deepest part of man's nature, and that the physical body as we bear it about with us today is really not at all suited to the inner being of man. What was it that Adam and Eve felt when they no longer were in the position to see each other without the physical body? but when they did see each other in this body. They felt that they had fallen, had deteriorated into matter, that they had left a world to which formerly they had belonged, and had become impregnated with denser substance than was theirs previously. They felt that man had been transplanted with his physical body into a world to which, when the real nature of his ego is considered, he in no way belonged. No more suitable expression for this fact could be found than that man's being was overcome by a feeling of shame. Man was ashamed at so little of the outward expression of his being, the part perceptible to the senses, was really adapted to the divine ego. If we consider the same fact from another point of view, it, prevents, it presents itself quite differently. We then see that if man had not descended into his physical body, had not taken on denser matter, he would not have been able to attain his ego-consciousness, or, as the Greeks expressed it, would not have been able to participate in the forces of Dionysus. The Greeks were well aware of this. They felt that the ego of man, as it lives on the physical plane, has within it not only those forces of a higher spiritual world, which it had before the fall, forces that stream into it, if we may say so, from the upper spiritual worlds. But they felt that this ego is dependent upon forces which originate from quite another side, from the opposite side. We know that previous to his present ego consciousness, man had normally a clairvoyant consciousness. He had this clairvoyant consciousness in ancient times, but it was a picture-like dreaming conscious, dreamy consciousness, and was not illuminated by true intellectual light. This he only acquired later. The old clairvoyant consciousness had to be lost by man, that thereby a new consciousness might appear. For this it was necessary that the old form of the ego, the old Dionysus Zagrius, should perish. We have had before our minds this grand picture of how the old clairvoyant consci consciousness perished or, as expressed by Greek mythology, how the ancient Dionysus Zagreus was torn to pieces by the Titans, and how he reappeared later in the age of the younger Dionysus, the younger Dionysus being our present-day consciousness, which is a product of the progress brought about in the course of the evolution of humanity. But it was necessary that the earthly mother, Semele, should take part in the production of the younger Dionysus, and in the form of Semele, the Greek soul showed how sure and full of wisdom were its feelings regarding true world wonders. What then was the supposition regarding the younger Dionysus, or let us say the younger human ego? In order to make the coming of this ego possible, it was necessary that the old clairvoyant consciousness should have died out, and that everything belonging to the ancient clairvoyance should have sunk below the horizon of man's consciousness. 
He who knows this, and it was known to those who narrated the Greek mythology, said, Once upon a time the human soul possessed clairvoyant consciousness and looked out into a world full of spiritual beings and spiritual facts, a world in respect of which man was still a fellow citizen of higher spiritual beings. In course of time man has passed out of this spiritual world and has become quite another being, one permeated by an ego. What would happen to the man of today if without any preparation or esoteric training there suddenly appeared to him, in place of the physical world, as perceived by physical eye and ear, that world which existed for the ancient clairvoyant consciousness? Let us suppose, through some cosmic miracle or other, that in place of the star-strewn heavens, the world we see through the rising and setting sun, the mountains and mists, the minerals, plants and animals, there should suddenly appear before the normal consciousness of a modern man the world of the old Atlantean. Let us accept this for the moment as an hypothesis. That person would be entirely crushed, so terrifying, so awesome would the world appear, which all the same is the world that surrounds us. For this world comprises all things, it is around us, it exists everywhere. This world is, however, concealed from us by the world of our ego. We may say a world is all around us that would fill people with terror, that would entirely overwhelm them, if in their present condition they were suddenly to be confronted by it. This was still felt by the soul of ancient Greece. We find it contained also in that most wise and wonderful edifice, the legend of Dionysus. Dionysus had to come from another side than that of the cosmic wonders in which the ancient Greek consciousness had placed the figure of Zeus and the other figures of the upper heaven. The ancient Greek felt that in all that existed as the world of men, something lived that was different from what lived above in the world of Zeus. The ancient Greek felt that the world over whose surface we wander had another substantial ingredient. He felt that intermingled with our physical human existence was an element that was not present at first in the supersensible world. Hence the younger Dionysus, who represents our new consciousness, could not, like the old Dionysus, be a son of Persephone and Zeus, but he had to be a son of Semele, a son of an earthly mother and Zeus. We must keep in mind what was then added by the Greek consciousness to this legend in its further development. Through the machinations of Hera, it was brought about that Semele should see Zeus in his true form, not as the ancient Atlantean demigod, but as he really now is. This could only be by means of clairvoyant consciousness. That Semele was to see Zeus for a moment as he really was meant nothing else than that Semele became for a moment clairvoyant. She perished in the flames because she saw Zeus in the flames of the astral world, that is, she saw him clairvoyantly. She was crushed to atoms, as indeed the ego-consciousness of man would be, if it were suddenly confronted by the astral world. All great occult facts, all truths concerning cosmic wonders, we find concealed in one place or another in the world of Greek legend. We also find hidden therein the fact that Dionysus, the macrocosmic representative of the ego, which every man with normal consciousness can see only in a single example, is descended from a being of the physical world. That what to our normal physical eye is only Maya was embodied in Dionysus. That in other words Dionysus had to participate in the great world illusion or Maya. When, in the modern trivial sense, we speak of cosmic wonders, we mention physical, biological, chemical laws. The Greek spoke in splendid pictures, and these really go very much further into cosmic wonders than our laws, dealing as they do merely with the surface. We see, therefore, how, thrown off from this Greek mythology, like a mighty occult script, emerges the question, quote, Verily, when we keep in mind this specifically human ego, should we, if it were to reveal itself in a bodily form, be able to look upon this form presented to us thus externally in the physical world? No, for this is Maya, 
and is in no wise an external expression for the true ego, which is of such a kind that the true ego in Adam and Eve was rightly ashamed of its external bodily form. What, as men, we have before us today is in fact a contradiction, and this was felt by the Greek, by the very Greek of whom it has frequently been said with great superficiality that he gave his attention only to the external beauties of nature. It was especially the Greek who felt that the external human form is full of contradiction. The Greek was not a naturalist, as we understand the term today, but he understood very deeply that the form in which man walks the earth is a compromise. From no side does it appear as it really is. Let us suppose that this human form had arisen under the influence of the physical, etheric, and astral bodies alone, that no ego had taken up its abode in it, that it had only been constructed on the earth with the characteristics it had brought it had brought over from the ancient Saturn, Sun, and Moon incarnations of our earth. This human form would then have been different from what it really is. If the earth had not given to man his ego, the human beings wandering to and fro upon the earth would have had quite another external physical form. In a certain hidden manner, the soul of ancient Greece put to itself this question, how would the human form have looked today if there were egoless men upon the earth? men who had not participated in the blessings of the earth or in the development of the ego men who had not taken into themselves Dionysus. If such persons walked among us as had developed only under the influence of the forces of the physical, the etheric and the astral bodies, what would they have looked like? And the Greek soul put to itself another question with wonderful spirituality with a depth of inward feeling impossible of expression. If nothing but the ego existed, if the ego had not entered into a physical and etheric and an astral body, what form would it have? It would not have such a physical human body as it has now, but this ego would be furnished with a spiritual body, which would be entirely different from the external human body. This spiritual body which would exist only for clairvoyant consciousness, could never really be revealed in the physical world. What then really is the human being who goes hither and thither on the earth? He is neither an egoless man, influenced only by the astral body, the etheric body and the physical body, nor is he an ego man, but a combination of the two. He results from the intermingling of these two. Man, as he appears to us outwardly, is a composite being. That was what the ancient Greeks felt when they said to themselves, if the younger Dionysus was really the first teacher of intellectual civilization, we must assume with regard to him that he was not yet in a human body which had already come under the influence of the ego, for man had first to receive the intellectual ego through the influence of the Dionysus civilization. Dionysus must still represent this human ego outside of the human physical body. Thus, the Greek consciousness could only form an adequate idea of Dionysus and of that movement which I have described as the civilizing march of Dionysus over the earth by imagining that the real ego of Dionysus had not yet taken up its abode in a human body, but was just on the point of doing so. That Dionysus and all belonging to him had such human bodies as were bound to arise if no ego were in them, if the human body was only influenced by the forces of the physical, etheric, and astral body. The Greeks answered these questions by saying, the people who followed Dionysus on his journey could not have looked like the men of the present time, whose bodies were composed of the indivis invisible ego body and the external body. It must have been that the ego enveloped the bodily form invisibly, like an aura, and that this bodily form had developed, as it must have done, under the influence of the forces of the physical, etheric, and astral bodies. That is, as a man must have developed on the earth who had come over from the old moon, with the forces of human nature belonging to it, 
and who would have continued to develop on the earth without the earth ego having entered into him. It was because the Greek soul was able to give a correct answer to this world wonder that it represented symbolically in the form of Dionysus and especially in the forms of those who were represented as the followers of Dionysus, such human forms as had the ego outside them and could reveal only the forces of the etheric, physical and astral bodies. These are Silenos or Selenus and the satyrs who followed in the train of Dionysus, that wonderful creation of pictorial forms thought out by the Greeks. As such would man appear if we could sever that which is a composite thing. Imagine to yourselves that through some magic means the physical, etheric and astral bodies of a human being could be treated so that we could separate from them the actual supersensible and invisible body of the ego. Then that human being would have such a form as those persons had who followed in the train of Dionysus. But in their wonderful mythology the Greeks represented something else. We know that the ego entered only gradually into the human form, that in ancient Atlantean times this ego was still not within the human body. How must we then picture Atlantean bodies? Greek fancy and Greek intuition pictured in a wonderful way the ordinary, normal, partitioned man of Atlantean times in the satyrs and the fauns and in Pan. Under the present conditions on earth, such human forms could naturally not come about, and forms like those of satyrs, the fauns, and indeed the whole following of Dionysus, consisted of those stragglers among the Atlanteans who had preserved most faithfully the human form of the Atlanteans. It was precisely these men who had the least of the ego within them that Dionysus had to take with him on his journey, because he had to become the first teacher of the ego. Hence we see that in this train of the followers of Dionysus the Greeks represented the old partitioned Atlantean. Certainly their equipment was such that they were not provided with a solid scaffolding of bones as we are. The human body has solidified since then. In Atlantean times it was, if I may so describe it, much softer. Hence this Atlantean body could not be preserved and it will be a hard task for the geology and paleontology of the day to find any relics of the real Atlantean people. But there is another paleontology, another geology, which has preserved the men of Atlantis' forces, the mythology of Greece. It is not in the strata of the earth that we should dig if we want to know the men of ancient times, men who still had their higher bodily nature outside their physical bodies. It is absolutely absurd for men thus to burrow among the geological strata of the earth. They will never find there aught save decadent products of prehistoric men. But in the strata of human spiritual life, in the strata of spiritual geology, in that, for instance, which has remained for us in the wonderful mythology of Greece, There we find preserved, even as we find snails and shellfish preserved in the geological strata of the earth, the ancient partitioned man of Atlantis. If we study the configuration of the fauna, of the fauns, of Pan and of Silenus, we get those remains of spiritual geology which really lead us to the primeval humanity of the earth. In them we see that in a manner which nowadays people consider eccentric, dreamy, fantastic, the old Greek consciousness nevertheless solved these world wonders in a more profoundly scientific sense than does our abstract, external, prosaic, intellectual science today. What prehistoric men looked like is told us today in endless contradictory Darwinistic and anti-Darwinistic hypotheses. The ancient Greeks put this world wonder before us in a manner that satisfies our soul. Neither Hackalism nor any other branch of Darwinism nor geological fossil hunting will furnish an answer regarding the external physical form of the prehistoric men on our earth. 
but the Greek myths solve for us this world wonder by presenting to us the actual forms of the followers of Dionysus. Anyone aware of all the ramifications of detail connected with the true evolution of man, as revealed by the Akashic records, knows also that fantasy and fanaticism do not exist in spiritual science or in what has been said to you today. Fantasy and fanatical dreaming are found in the abstract intellectual science of today, which believes it can dig out of the physical strata of the earth and can study that which cannot possibly be there and overlooks the study of that spiritual geology whose wondrous script can still be deciphered to the salvation of the advance of human wisdom in the mythology of Greece. The end of Lecture 6